we will show you how to use MicroGL. And we're going to start out by looking at just the images that come included with the software. That way you don't have to download anything or use any other images. In future videos, we'll see how you can drag and drop different images to view them. But for right now, we I know that every single copy of the software comes with these same basic images. So that will allow you to follow along very easily without needing anything other than the basic software downloaded, which I've linked below. And MRI CrowGL runs on Mac, Windows computers, and Linux computers, and it works the same way on each one of these computers. So it doesn't matter what system you have, everything will be easy. And once you learn how to use it on one computer, you'll be able to translate to another computer without any problems. So we're going to open images. And you can do this with a file open menu or through dragging and dropping. And many of the included images are included in the open standard menu. And these are standard images that are included with the software. So to start out with, let's take a look at the T1 scan. So if you choose the T1 scan that comes with the software, you'll see an image where in this image, what's really bright is fat. So we can see that the white matter of the brain is coated in myelin, which is a fatty substance. And likewise, the scalp of the head has a lot of fat in it. So we have a lot of subcutaneous fat around the skin. And so that's really what's going to drive the brightness in this image. And water, in terms of cerebral spinal fluid, and air are dark in this image. So they have very little contrast. And gray matter is somewhere in between. It's a mid-level gray. It's not as bright as the fatty white matter and it's not as dark as the air and the water in your brain. So the other thing you'll notice is that there's a color bar here that's going from zero to about 144. And this is showing the brightness range that's been selected in this image. And so right now, anything that's darker than zero will be shown as full black, and anything that's brighter than 144 will be shown as full white. The layer menu on the left allows you to change how the image appears. So we could change the brightness or contrast by changing the darkness level. So we could hide anything that's, let's say, darker than 30. And we could change the brightness, the maximum brightness. And so we could make anything brighter than 120 full white. And so that's one way that we can change the contrast and brightness. Another way you can do that is by right-clicking and dragging over a region of the image. And it'll highlight that region so that it has typical contrast, so that it goes from dark to black. So if I select an area that's very dark in the image and scroll over it, the whole image will become bright to try to emphasize the range of brightness in that um, very dark region. On the other hand, if I select a very bright area and select over it, it'll adjust the contrast to, so that now, in this case, a voxel has to be brighter than 109 to be anything other than black. So the dragging and drop, uh, dragging your right mouse is a very easy way to set the contrast for region of the brain that you're interested in and get a contrast value that looks nice to your eyes. The other way that you can change the appearance is with this color appear bar. So right now we're looking at grays but we could choose a different color range. So now we have a color lookup table that's still going from black to a much brighter red, but it's going through blues and greens and yellows. And so you can choose a different color range to try to show different appearances of the image, or you can just stick with the classic grayscale. Going to the next panel, we can start thinking about selecting different areas of space in the brain. And usually the easiest way to do this is just click with the mouse. And so if I click near the front eyeball, I'll see the eyeball in all three of the different views, the sagittal view over here, the coronal view on the upper left, and at the bottom, the axial slice. So I can just click at the location I want to look at. But we can also look at different slices by going anterior or posterior, by clicking left or right, and deciding to go superiorly or inferiorly. 
And a final way that we can select where we want to look at the brain is we can choose the coordinates. We can put in the spatial position. And a nice analogy for this is to think about latitude and longitude, where we can tell people where we are in the planet by saying how far north-south and how far east-west we are. And with the brain, we tend to like to think about our brain being centered around the anterior commissure. And so our origin, our Greenwich, is right here. And we'll measure how far away we are from this. And this requires the brain to be approximately aligned to other brains. So uh, we're making an assumption here that the image you're looking at is already aligned to match a typical brain's orientation. But if this is the case, we can decide how far we want to look. Let's say if I choose a positive 30 in this first box, I'm now looking 30 millimeters to the right of the anterior commissure. And if I choose minus 30, I'm looking 30 millimeters to the left of that location. And likewise, this middle value, I can choose how far anterior or posterior I am. So if I choose positive 50 for the Y coordinate, I'm now seeing a slice that includes the front eyeballs. And if I choose minus 50, I'm now going to look at a location that's toward the back of the head. And so the middle value chooses how far in the anterior posterior coordinate we're looking at. And then the final value we have is how far in the head foot direction we're looking. So a positive value means we're looking at a location superiorly toward the top of your head. And a negative value would be a slice that's near the bottom of your head. And if you are having trouble seeing the crosshair, you can change its width or you can change its color. And so we can try to make it a little more salient to try to show where we've selected in the brain image. And those three values, those three coordinates, also explain the numbers that I see when I click a different location on the image. Here it's saying I'm clicking at a location of the brain that's minus 18 millimeters to the left, minus 12 millimeters posteriorly, and minus 60 millimeters inferiorly from the anterior commissure. So we can look at any location and get a good idea of where we're looking in the brain. Since we're talking about these different coordinates, it's worth saying that one of the most important things when looking at medical images is to make sure you know which side of the brain is left and which side of the brain is right. And this is tricky because our bodies are symmetrical, roughly speaking. And so the left side and right side are pretty easy to confuse in a way that confusing the anterior or posterior direction of our brain or superior and inferior isn't. And so that symmetry can be tricky. But adding to this is the fact that neurologists like to see the left side of the brain on the left side of the image and the right side of the brain on the right side of the image. And this is not the case with radiologists. They like to see the reverse view. And so from the radiologist's perspective, they like to imagine looking at an individual as if they're looking at them from their feet. And so from that vantage point, the patient's left side is on the viewer's right side. And so again, if you're sitting with a, a, a patient's bed at their feet, looking up toward their head, you're going to have that reversal. And so that's why it's important to look for this left marking to tell us which side is the left side of the image. And with the software, you can go to preferences and you can actually choose whether you prefer having a radiological orientation. And now the image has been mirror flipped so that now the right side of the brain is on the left side of the image. Or if you have this unselected, we'll be back to neurological convention. So you can have your own preference of how you want to look at a brain. But you should always be careful when looking at brains that you know what convention is being used to display the brain. The next thing that we have in this slice selection panel is a way that we can zoom in and out. There's a slider that allows us to look more closely at the brain. So we can zoom in and out. And so you can also get the same feature by using your scroll wheel and holding down the control key. 
and that allows you to zoom in and out. And in fact, if you double click at a location uh, with the control key down, you're now selecting that location as a point of expansion for your image. So you can choose where you want to look in an image and zoom in and out. Or another way to do that is if you hold the control key down and you drag the image left and right, you can actually pan the image in its viewpoint to choose where the center of the image is going to be. So there's the control key modifies how you zoom in and out of an image and where the image is going to be shown. If you want to go back to the default view where the image takes the entire screen space that's allotted to it and no more, you can hit zoom and I'll zoom out so that the image is nicely oriented to use the screen. Since we're talking about using screen space, it's also worth saying that if we want to, we can hide that color bar. If we now already talked about how we can change different colors and choose brightnesses and other range, we can see the image a little bit better. We can make it a little larger by not using screen real estate to show the color bar. So we can just turn that so it's no longer visible. And now we can see the brain using the more of the screen real estate. Another thing to point out when we zoom in on an image, we can zoom in and right click and drag to try to change the contrast a little bit, is we can choose how jagged the image appears to us. And so let's get a nice looking contrast here. So this smooth button will make the image look a little more gentle. It'll look at neighboring voxels to determine the color. And without the smooth, we'll see the actual resolution of the image and the jagged edges that exist there. Another feature we have here is the ruler button, and it shows how wide 10 centimeters is. So we can decide to have 10 centimeters uh, will be smaller if we're zoomed out. And as we zoom in, 10 centimeters is going to be a larger range. So this gives us a good idea of how large the object we're looking at is. So I'm going to click Zoom again to get back to our default range. And again, this bottom lines button allows me to choose how thick the crosshair is and the color of the crosshair. So we can easily choose a nice color for our display. So that's a basic look at the different standard views that we have. And here we're seeing three slices of the brain simultaneously. And that's a nice way to navigate a three-dimensional object. But if you want, the display button, the display menu, allows you to choose different views. And so right now we're looking at this multiplanar axial plus coronal plus sagittal. But if we only want to see a sagittal view of the brain, we can choose that. And if we're looking at the image, we can use the scroll wheel to scroll up and down between slices. And we can click on slices to click on different locations. And so that's an easy way to navigate in three-dimensional space through this image of the brain. We could also do the display menu and choose coronal to choose the coronal slice of the brain. And again, the scroll wheel scrolls between slices. And by clicking with the mouse, we can choose within the slice where we want to look at. And then finally, we have the sagittal view. And we can click on a sagittal view. And again, scroll wheel allows us to scroll between slices and mouse clicks allow us to select locations within a slice. And then finally, we have the render view. And we'll talk about this more in a future presentation. But right now, just know that we can also look at the brain by using the render menu. And the final view we can use is we can use the mosaic view. And this allows us to use multiple slices simultaneously, and we can overlay the slices. And this is nice for publications where we want to show results. And so the mosaic is definitely one of the more complicated views, but it's a nice way where we can see different slices of the same brain simultaneously, and we can custom choose what slices we see, whether we see a rendering along with our other slices, or let's say we have a sagittal view that we could add in, plus a coronal view, and we can choose those different slices and look at those simultaneously. So the mosaic allows us to look at multiple images 
in a much more custom fashion. But for most tasks, looking at this multiplanar view is usually the, the nicest, and it's kind of your, the default view to look at. So now we've looked at a T1 scan. Let's just briefly look at a couple of other standard scans that we have. If I look at the T2 image, here's an image of the brain that has very different contrast. At first, it looks like we've just reversed the T1 scan. What was black is now white, but this actually isn't the case. In this scan, what's really bright is water. And so we can see areas of brain injury and areas of water tend to be very bright in the T2 scan. And fat's not so bright, now it's a dark gray. But it's not simply a reverse of the T1. Remember in the T1, both air and water were dark. They had the same contrast, they were both dark tissues. Now air is dark, but water is bright. And so the T1 scan actually allows us to see different properties than what we were able to see in the T2 and vice versa. So each one of these modalities shows us unique properties of the brain and its tissues, and we can see those tissues differently. And that'll become important in future talks where we look at brain injury and how these different modalities will show us different features of the brain. And going through open, sta open standard again and looking at some of the standard images we have available, we can also look at a CT scan. And that was a CT scan of the abdomen. Let's choose the CT scan of the brain by choosing the image CT Phillips. And now we're seeing a CT scan. And what's very bright in a CT scan is bone. And so again, if I can right click and drag, I can see that the bone is extremely bright. It stops x-rays very well. Where the soft tissue of the brain, regardless of whether it's uh, water, which is relatively dark, or white matter, which is darkish, or gray matter, which is just a little bit brighter, they all have pretty similar contrast relative to bone. So bone is extremely bright in the CT scan, and water and gray matter and white matter are all much darker. And so the CT scan has, again, a very different type of contrast, but we can look at that and we can adjust that and we can choose images, uh, choose color palettes that try to show us the features that we want to see for a particular scan very nicely. Going back to open standard, we can also look at what the brain looks like if we were take, to take physical photographs of the brain. And so this visible human image shows you what the brain looks like if you were to photograph it with visible light. And so while this is a nice looking way, idea of what the brain looks like in visible light, to create an image like this, we actually have to slice someone's brain physically. We can't take such an image with MRI scans or CT scans. So this is an individual who uh, had his brain sacrificed and sliced after death. He was actually a murderer, and uh, so his brain was devoted to science. And we can now look at his brain, and we can see what the brain would look like um, if we were to see it with visible light. But this is very rare. It's very time-consuming to take microtome photographs of a brain, and it's very expensive. And so this is, allows us to see what the brain looks like and to see features. So for example, we can see the air sinuses in front of the brain quite well here. We can see the uh, white matter is indeed quite white, but the gray matter is actually much more reddish in color. It has a lot more blood in it. So even though we refer to this as gray matter, with a living human brain, gray matter tends to have a much more reddish color. And then also in the open standard, we can have some images of the brain where we've removed the scalp and are just looking at the brain. And so this is a template brain. It's a very average brain to have a very average size shape of a brain that we can compare to other people's brains. So this is the SPM 152 brain. And we can look at locations on this brain in the same manner. And so that concludes our first tutorial of looking at brain images using MRI CROGL and future tutorials we'll look at other types of images and clinical modalities, and we'll build off of this lecture.